So I think we are now uh, at the 4.40 p.m. or um, 10.40 Central European summer time. So I would like to start with the last session of the 14th International Conference on, on Gravitation, Astrophysics and Cosmology. Um, my name is Klaus Lemmerzahl. I'm from the University of Bremen. And now I'm the chair of the session. The first speaker is uh, now Suzuki Noda from Yangchu University. And he is talking about the blend spots Nyack process as Alphenic Super Radiant. So please, Suzuki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. Uh, my name is Suzuki Noda uh, from Yangchu University. Uh, actually, we have thunderstorm now here, so maybe it's noisy. So please, please uh, listen to. Uh, actually, this uh, project is the collaboration with uh, Yasusada Nambu at Nagoya University in Japan and Masaki Takahashi in Japan, and their students and Takuma Tsukamoto. <clears throat> and the references are these two papers. The first one is based is the discussion for BTZ black string space time. And now we are writing a paper for car case. So I will tell you about it. I will talk about uh, for car case in this talk. The uh, Alvenic super radiance uh, is a super radiant scattering of alpha wave. And the bland photos like process is one of the widely discussed the uh, engine mechanism for astrophysical jet like this. So which is a collimated uh, stream of plasma and uh, close, closing up like this. Uh, here, uh, there is a supermassive black hole. So I'm interested in what mechanism drives the jet. So actually one of the, the most discuss widely discussed mechanism is blunt folded snake process. So this process can, uh, the black holes, black holes uh, rotational energy can be given to the jet. And in the original context of the blunt polytonic process, uh, they assume the car black hole with slowly rotation. And they, con they consider the stationary axisymmetric rotating magnetosphere in the force free uh, approximation. Can you see my castle here? This one, can you see this one? Castle. Yes, one can see it. Okay. Yes. okay, thank you. And they evaluated the pointing flux for the rotating magnetosphere, and it is proportional to omega f times omega h minus omega f. Here, omega f is the angular velocity of the magnetic field line. Omega h is the angular velocity of the ZAMO at the horizon, so the angular velocity of the black hole itself. So from this, uh, if this inequality is satisfied, we have the non-zero outward flux. So this uh, means the rotational energy of the black hole is extracted by magnetosphere. And the power is very large enough to explain the relativistic jet. But we have some questions. Uh, in realistic case, uh, although they assume the stationary, but in realistic case, the, the system is not stationary. So there must be some kind of wave propagation. And also we are interested in the essence of the busy process, namely the what uh, carries the energy. That is our question. And for a uh, non-stationary case, the, some people have been discussed with numerical simulation based on the GRMHD. But in dynamical case, must have wave propagation here in the magnetosphere. So, but it is difficult to discuss how wave modes contribute to the wave, uh, the energy extraction, because everything is mixed in the numerical calculation. So uh, we discuss the wave propagation in magnetosphere analytically. And also the, uh, recently, the, by Kinoshita and Igata, uh, uh, the essence of the blunder holotsnaik process was discussed. Actually, uh, one of the, their results is that the similarity between these two uh, phenomena. One is the blunt photosynthetic process, and it is similar to this, this phenomenon. Uh, there's a string attached to the spinning object, 
and the string since string has the tension so the spinning of the speed the spinning ob object uh spins down uh due to the tension of the string so uh we, so we have I an ideas so wave wave regarding the magnetic tension in magnetosphere and its super radiance may be related to the busy process so that the wave the wave is the alpha waves the, actually this is the propagation propag this propag this is propagating mode uh due to the magnetic tension but unfortunately uh, it has been it has been thought the super radiance for alpha wave is not possible but uchida discussed the based on the icono limit in 19, 1997 but actually we saw we dealt with the wave function directly without a uh, short wavelength limit we showed it is possible in this paper but this paper uh, discussed the btz plug string space time which is not astrophysical one so in this talk uh, let me show you let me dis let us discuss for the car case which is astrophysical as astrophysical black hole so we first uh obtain a full three magnetosphere around the car black hole and then give a perturbation to the background magnetosphere and we obtain a mo wave modes uh, actually in full three magnetosphere there are two different wave modes fast magnet sonic wave and alpha wave actually in some case cases these wave modes wave modes can be decoupled and then we focus on the alpha wave equation we discuss we consider the wave scattering problem of alpha wave and then we evaluate the reflection rate and the pointing flux to discuss the relation between the busy process and alvenic super radiance okay so let me start with the what the force free magnetic sphere is so in the system we saw uh, there are plasma and a magnetic field so the equations we solve is this one but if the electromagnetic fields are do dominant the plasma part can be ignored approximately so the elect uh, so the uh, energy momentum tensor of the magnetic electromagnetic field itself is conserved approximately this is called a force free approximation for in this approx uh, uh, within this approximation the maxwell's equation go like this go these two equations and actually the f mu nu uh, satisfying this these equations can be expressed with two scalars called euler potentials and the Maxwell's equation uh, for this system can be written uh, these two equations for phi 1 and phi 2. So we solve these equations uh, in the car space time uh, and we obtain the magnetosphere in the car space time. And actually, for stationary and axisymmetric case, the Euler potentials can be written like this. So we can start with this ansatz. So substitute this ansatz to the basic equation, and we solve the for psi one and psi two. So here, uh, let me explain the meaning of the phi one and phi two. Actually, actually, the phi one is equal to constant. It is a magnetic surface. This this red surfaces, and phi two is equal to constant. Uh, gives the magnetic field line or on each magnetic surface. So axisymmetric magnetosphere uh, is foliated by magnetic surface like this. And giving the perturbation to the magnetosphere, we have we get the two different wave modes. The alpha wave uh, is propagating mode, pr uh, propagate, propagate on the magnetic surface, and a fast mode can across the surfaces. <clears throat> But actually, the, to obtain the magnetosphere globally in the car space time is very, 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 very difficult. So let me focus on the the magnetosphere solution in the in the vicinity of the equatorial plane of the car black hole. So we start with this ansatz for the Euler potentials, and give and substituting this ansatz to Maxwell's equation, uh, it gives the equation for phi one and phi two. And we can solve this uh, like this, where C is determined by the regularity at the horizon, and which is proportional to omega h minus omega f. And we, we can calculate the electromagnetic field as well like this. 
Okay, so let's check if the BZ process works for this solution. Uh, we can evaluate it by, by checking the P mu energy flux vector uh, whose R component corresponds to the pointing flux. And this result uh, tells us the, if this inequality is satisfied, that we have the non-zero outward flux. So uh, the BZ process works for this, this magnetosphere solution. Okay, so let's give a perturbation to the background field. So since the perturbation is the deviation of the background field, let me write the perturbation like this uh, with displacement vector, theta. So since for, this, uh, for the present magne uh, background magnetosphere uh, has the theta equal constant theta equal constant magnetic surface. So the perturbation uh, regarding the theta theta gives the perturbation perpendicular to the magnetic surface like this. So this generates the Aufben wave, which is transverse wave mode along the magnetic surface. The perturbations uh, in the other directions, in other directions, uh, gives the longitudinal mode, which is the magnetosonic fast wave like this. Uh, since we are interested in uh, Aufben wave now, so we solve the second equation here. <coughs> this one. So respecting the property that Aufben wave propagates along the magnetic field line, we can separate a variable like this. <coughs> here A rho is, a, uh, is an arbitrary function of rho, and rho is equal constant gives the magnetic field line. Actually, the choice of a rho uh, corresponds to the choice of the co choice of the perturbation because a rho determines the configuration of the perturbation in the phi direction in the magnetosphere. So, for example, if we choose a rho is equal to one, uh, that corresponds to that means the axisymmetric perturbation. If we choose a as delta function. Uh, means that we pick up one magnetic field line given by rho is equal to zero rho node and give a perturbation. <clears throat> and, and after separating the variables, uh, the wave equation can be written like this. Uh, although this equation looks very complicated, but actually we can rewrite this equation in, in the form of the Schrodinger type equation, one dimensional Schrodinger type equation like this. Here, gamma uh, is a norm of the chi, chi mu, which is four ve vector of a co-rotating observer with a magnetic field line, given like this. Okay, so to get the Schrodinger type equation, uh, we introduce a new coordinate like this, capital T and capital X, like this. And then uh, after this co in this coordinate, uh, we can eliminate the cross term of the wave function, wave equation, and then we, we get this equation. And actually gamma, uh, which is a norm of the, or this one, co-rotating observer, gamma equals zero uh, actually gives the light surfaces. Uh, in this space, in this magnetosphere, we have two light surfaces. And light surfaces actually is a kind of a singularity, <coughs> actually a singular, singular point for the Aufben wave. <coughs> actually, that corresponds to the one, that gives the one-way boundary for Aufben waves. And we can show this by examining the ray motion of Aufben wave. And especially the inner light surface is an effective horizon for Aufben wave. So we give a purely ingoing boundary condition at the inner light surface. But instead of that, uh, we have kind of coordinate singularity. So we introduce uh, the totus coordinate like this to remove the singularity like this. And then we assume the stationary scattering problem like this. So the time dependence of the wave function can be written like this with frequency. And then we obtain the Schrodinger type equation like this. <coughs> so this is the uh, Aufben wave equation. Uh, which, propag which propagates along a magnetic field line. <clears throat> okay, the 
potential has one peak like this. So if we add the, the negative infinity uh, corresponds to the inner light surface and the positive infinity corresponds to the outer light surface. So if we generate a wave, for example, around here, around, around here, we have both ingoing and outgoing wave. But in at the light inner light surface, uh, we only have purely ingoing wave because of the property of the inner light surface. So we get the asymptotic solution of this equation like this. And then uh, uh, using the conservation of the Ronskian, we get the relation between A in and A out, and we get the reflection rate like this. So uh, looking at this, uh, if omega f uh, satisfies this inequality, the reflection rate can exceed unity. And here, omega r in is the, it means the dragging effect at the light surfaces. <clears throat> so the important things for alvenic, alvenic super radiance is the dragging effect, the, the relation between dragging effect at light surfaces and angular velocity of the magnetic field line. Actually, this super radiant condition is exactly the same as the condition for the busy process. To show that, uh, we use this figure. Actually, the R out and R in depends on omega f, so the super radiant condition can be written like this. So we have to solve the, this inequality for omega f to understand what the inequality is. So, but it's complicated, so we use this figure. <laughs> this figure uh, in the uh, is the horizontal axis is the omega f, and the blue curve is the uh, omega in as a function of omega f, and the red curve is a uh, omega r out as a function of omega f. So this super radiant condition tells us that uh, this black line is a uh, omega f is equal to omega f. So this is 45 degree 45 degrees line in this figure. So this the super radiant condition tells us the black line should be sandwiched by these two blue and red curves. If you look at this figure in the horizontal direction, but it means uh, actually the, if you look at this figure in the vertical direction, the this means the omega f should be should be in the range zero and omega h like this. So uh, from from this figure, we can show that this super radiant condition is exactly the same as the condition for the busy process. Okay. So uh, let me show you some uh, results. And this is the reflection rate uh, evaluated by numerical calculation. And indeed, the reflection rate can exceed unity uh, when the busy, when the super radiant condition is satisfied. This A is a spin parameter of the car black hole. So, so for larger car black, larger spin case, uh, the reflection rate becomes larger. <clears throat> okay. So moreover, we found some kind of peak in the in this plot. This is the three D plot of the inverse of A in squared. So these peaks corresponds to the A, A in is equal to zero, which is like a quasi normal mode of a black hole. But this one, uh, but this omega F and omega is a real one, real, not imagined, not complex. So actually we haven't understood what, th what these are, but maybe these are resonant scattering this represents the res resonant scattering of Alton wave. So uh, we expect that resonant scattering could e induce burst-like emission in magnetosphere, uh, which has uh, information of magnetosphere. But to discuss, to discuss the detail, we need to take into account the plasma effect. So uh, w that we, we cannot discuss in force free approximation. Okay, uh, to discuss the relation between the busy process and alvenic super radiance, uh, let me show you the pointing flux, computation of the pointing flux. 
the this is the result. <coughs> the the pointing flux uh, of the background and the open wave can be factorized by this common factor omega f times omega h minus omega f. And the first term in the bracket comes from the background, and the second and third terms comes from the wave plot. But the, since the second term doesn't depend on omega, so this is the zero mode of alpha wave. Alpha wave, alpha, alpha wave. So if you take the long wavelength, long wavelength limit, the we get this uh, result, this uh, pointing flux here, and if we regard this part as a deformed new background, new deformed new background, uh, like just like the magenta cup in this figure. So this is so the resulting the pointing flux is nothing but the pointing flux for the busy process with deformed deformed magnetic field line. So that means the zero mode of the alvenic super radiance is incorporated into the background. So the alvenic super radiance, <coughs> so, so we can conclude the busy process is actually the long wavelength limit of the alvenic super radiance. Okay. So uh, let me summarize my talk. Uh, for these reasons, super the coincidence, the, for these reasons, a uh, super radiant condition and a pl pointing flux, uh, we conclude that the uh, alvenic super radiance is a kind of general, more general energy extraction mechanism, including the busy process as a long wavelength limit. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what's the next? Uh, is the, we need to take into account the plasma effect. So namely, we need to solve the magnetohydrodynamics, including the plasma, to discuss the, uh, how the energy, extracted energy by open waves can be transformed, can be converted to the kinetic energy of plasma to discuss the, the contribution of open wave in the jet. Okay, so uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very beautiful talk. Thank you. Are there questions from the audience? Are there no questions? We have enough time. There's seven minutes time for answering questions. So perhaps I ask a question. So you think that you now solve this problem, this uh, the, the unique solution for, for the explanation of the appearance of jets? Uh, sorry, could could you say it again? Maybe the network so is. Is this now the solution for for the creation of jets? Solution. The solution for the creation of jets, or are there uh, possibly other mechanisms which uh, may create jets? Mm, I'm sorry, it's difficult to catch you. Maybe okay. I maybe okay. no, there's a noise. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, which page do you mean? No, no, it it was a general question. So, what a uh, question. Uh, whether now is the this is the solution for for the description of jets, or are there possibly other mechanisms which may be applied in other situations? Perhaps other situations. Yeah. You mean other situation means the non-black hole case? Yeah, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is important that the, the system has algorithm to extract the rotational energy. Mm -hmm. So maybe this discussion can be used for only for black hole. 
but perhaps uh, if there is a there is not algorithm, uh, we can discuss the the transportation of the angular momentum uh, using the the uh, maybe that that could be regarded as the Albanic super radiance. Yes, although although yeah, if there is no algorithm, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Yes. Thank you very much for asking. Okay. Are there further questions from the audience? Okay, seems uh, not to I, be also, I have a short question <laughs> about the. Uh, I mean, in this case, you consider this reflection and uh, and uh, this PD process will be enhanced, or I mean, I didn't see clearly how, how did uh, it modify this traditional PD process. Uh, is it enhanced? Because the sign of these two terms is positive. So the BZ process is enhanced due to uh, by the wave effect. I see, I see. And I do the same frequency range. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes. Still possible to pose some questions? If it's not the case, then we thank you very much uh, for this beautiful talk. And um, then we go further to the next talk by Yun Lang Zhang. Yun Lang Zhang from Kyoto University about gravitational waves and possible fast radio bursts from axion clumps. Okay, ah, okay. It's, already, it's already there. So you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your, your okay, screen, okay. very good. Yeah, so that's... if you like, you may start right now. Right, right, yeah, probably let me start. And uh, so uh, thank you very much for host uh, this section and uh, uh, this is Yun Long Zhang and uh, currently a postdoc at the uh, Yukawa Institute in Kyoto University. And uh, my title is about uh, the rational waves and uh, the possible pass radio burst from the axon clocks. Um, here is my outline. So, firstly, I would like to introduce our motivation that uh, uh, why we study this phenomena. And I will firstly reveal some uh, part of the so-called icing clouds and the radiations. And especially I will focus on the possible signals from uh, this kind of uh, systems and especially on the gravitational waves. Um, it has been shown that, uh, for example, for the clouds of these super radiance modes and all the axing annualizations, we all giving some possible modes of this uh, gravitons. And especially there is uh, another interesting phenomena that uh, uh, in case this axion can decay into the gamma photons directly. And uh, for the mu EV axions, and uh, on this range will just uh, go to the gigahertz uh, photons, and which is exactly in the uh, observed the uh, range of these so-called fast radio bursts. And uh, so such a kind of clouds of action clouds is also considered as a kind of candidate uh, over jacket. And here in this work, we try to uh, see whether there are similar bursts of these gravitational waves of this system. And in that sense, we need to open the coupling between axions and gravitons. And, uh, and actually, this term has been well studied in the so-called uh, Shen-Simons modified gravities with a kind of uh, dynamical couplings, uh, dynamical axions. And the channel we are considering is the decay of this axion to this uh, gravitons directly. And uh, so this is the major part. And uh, um, in the upper side, we will join to analyze this, these two phenomena directly. And uh, in that sense, 
we will estimate uh, this branch ratio and the secondary efforts. And finally, we will consider this host of JPEGs and, uh, and whether it can be relevant uh, to the primordial black holes. And the first part is about uh, the motivation. And uh, we try to see whether we can see the signatures of the so-called axions through rational waves. So what is axions? Axions is actually one of the most uh, promising candidates of the cold dark matters. So originally it was proposed in 1970s to solving the so-called strong CP problem in the uh, QCD series. And uh, so in case we have this kind of new answers of these new particles, so, so such a kind of like ranging will the symmetry in the Lagrangian can be restored. So that's a very good motivation to introduce such a kind of uh, scalar particles without priority. Um, but the QCD axis is actually uh, uh, limited to a very small mass range. And after that, uh, there is also uh, uh, a lot of other motivations. But for example, we can have Effectively, we can have like QED axions, and uh, and especially from the string series or the peak reduction of the extra dimensions, so we can have a, a lot of uh, mass ranges which have a good motivations. And this mass ranges is considered as uh, kind of uh, good uh, candidates of the dark matters. And for example, in the very uh, light mass ranges, so these axions can, in principle, uh, uh, rotate uh, the zombie polarizations by a global angle. And in the uh, heavier ones, the mitre power spectrum can also be modified uh, by the effort of the axions. And here in uh, this talk, actually, we are more interested in this super dense range of black holes and uh, for either supermassive black holes or stellar mass black holes. Um, and uh, in principle, we can also extend uh, the mass of axions to heavier ranges. And in this part, actually, uh, the axion is formed surrounding the black holes, and this black hole is in the mass range of the uh, primordial black holes that can be uh, smaller than the one solar mass. Uh, and in this part, the axion is more unstable and which is easy to decay into either gamma photons or gravitational waves and that will be have some uh, candidate of the signals. Um, so the basic structure of this part is to say that actually the axion cloud can be can be formed from the super radiance of the black holes and for this super radiance we have heard from last talk, basically it can uh, extract energy from the uh, rotating black holes and uh, these particles will uh, a kind of uh, forming the so-called icing clouds and uh, and when the energy of this icing clouds uh, become enough or they are going to the excited state and then uh, they will become instability and uh, have more uh, signatures. And for this decay range, actually, yeah, it's more easier, for example, this axion is more easier to decay into gamma photons. And uh, we will, it has been shown that for the mu EV uh, axions, it can be a possible source for the uh, gigahertz radio waves, which may be relevant to the other radio post. Um, it's also a nice picture to show uh, how this process it happened. And uh, and uh, um, for example, here is the uh, kind of rotating black holes for the galaxy center. There is kind of supermassive, but for the stellar mass, uh, uh, the equation can also be happened in case this black hole is passing through some plasma or there is some planar stars. And, uh, and in this case, there will be a kind of occlusion disk and this disk will fit the rotation energy of these black holes and uh, and the, the super radiance is kind of uh, opposite process actually yeah as we see that in case this 
uh, superior dense mode is wave-like in very low frequency radius, and it can extract the energy from the uh, rotation uh, from the rotational energy of the of the angular momentum of the black holes. And especially for this kind of wave-like uh, particles, it can be become uh, uh, a kind of bound state surrounding these black black holes, which is a kind of formula. Uh, formulate a kind of so-called icing clouds, and it's similar to the uh, to the picture of the uh, hydrogen atoms. So there will be because this kind of particle is more wave-like, so there will effectively be some kind of different energy levels. So if this kind of icing cloud is all uh, all uh, uh, coded to the excited levels, so so after some time, it will uh, be collapsed into lower energy levels. So in this process, there will be some radiation of either photons or gravitons. And uh, so this is one channel of this, how, how the graviton is um, emitted from this uh, super radiance cloud. And it has been also estimated how in different parameter ranges and how, how this can be seen from our current detectors like uh, LIGO or even further LISA ranges. So because this mice of this axion is still uh, uh, not fixed, so it's there is a lot of open parameter ranges. So for the axis, axis it's the mice of the axions and uh, the, the Y is the uh, another parameter that uh, uh, the ratio of the axion mice is and uh, the black hole mice is. So basically there is a uh, 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 um, uh, open open ranges for the detections, and uh, this string has been estimated to be uh, ten to minus nineteen to ten to minus uh, twenty seven, and which uh, will be within the uh, detection range of LIGO and LISAs. Or, or it will be rolled or give some bound of these parameter ranges. Uh, so this is one uh, channel that. Uh, uh, how the gravitational wave can be general, generalized through these uh, processes. And there is also another channel that uh, these axion particles can also be uh, annihilated. And in this case, the two axions is annihilated into one graviton, so there will be also the, the possible signature of gravitational waves. And uh, but in this case, this kind of signal is a bit uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, smaller, and OG has also been estimated. And the strength is a bit lower than the uh, than the previous signals, uh, but it can still be a possibility to within the uh, sensitive uh, lines of the uh, LIGO or LISA observation. Um, okay, so so that's what I've been. Uh, studied in the previous paper by Asmina and uh, the collaborations and uh, uh, and here actually we yeah just uh, showing the outline actually we try to consider this additional uh, signal uh, those yeah whether this axion can decay into the gravitons directly and then we will show that uh, this channel will be able to kind of, uh, our post signals compare with the uh, last uh, uh, two, two, two channels. And before that, so let's, uh, as a warm up, so let's, uh, go through how the axion was decayed into gamma photons. Um, right. So this is the, uh, basic action of the axion and the uh, axion photon couplings. And, uh, uh, so this is the maximum part, and this is the range of the axions, and this is the key couplings between the uh, axions and the uh, photons. And uh, so this f f tilde is f tilde is the hue of the uh, uh, Maxwell stress. And uh, um, so basically, this is the coupling between axion and uh, two gamma photons. And uh, uh, so except this, so also so sometimes this. Axion is considered as a constant term, but uh, for the yeah for the proposal of axions is to consider this as a kind of dynamical term with kinetics and effective potentials, which was usually written as a kind of uh, 
uh, oscillationary potential. And I'm with the mice of the axis and I weigh the uh, decay constant. And now let's see how, how this uh, resonance efforts will, will happen. And uh, so from the Lagrangians, so we can have the equilateral motions. And this is the usual Klein uh, um, uh, equations of a scalar field. But for the axis, there is the additional sources of the uh, uh, Maxwell fields. And also this Maxwell field is also sourced by the uh, gradient of these axes. Uh, and now here is this uh, key assumptions that uh, assume this axis is wave-like because it's in the very, very low frequency and the low mass ranges. So this is the difference, uh, difference with the additional picture that usually axis is considered as kind of particle-like. So even in the most of the detections. Yeah, but here in case we give a, a more clear picture that how, how this uh, resonance will happen in these wave-like equations. So in that sense, this X is assumed to be a kind of coherent state. So like this X in cloud, so all the modes is a kind of coherent and oscillate in terms of this time. And, uh, and this I'm, MYA is just relevant to the frequency of these axes. And uh, so theta zero is constrained by the decay constant, and this phi zero is just the, the phase factor. Uh, and now this is still coupling functions, but uh, in principle we can yeah we can uh, we can assume this gauge potential is uh, hom uh, homogeneous genius in the x and y directions. And in that sense, we can uh, have these helicity modes and a plus and a minus, which is uh, yeah, just a, a, a kind of a composite of these x, y directions. In that sense, the uh, Maxwell field is, can become decoupled into uh, two modes. So this uh, plus and minus modes become two decoupled equations. And this a dot is also uh, just a cosine functions due to our assumptions because it's just a kind of coherent state. Uh, it's very familiar equation, and this equation is just uh, this so-called modulus equations that in the typical frequency ranges, there will be a kind of exponentially growing modes. So that's why uh, the resonance happened. And if we go to, yeah, it's more clear to see that if we go to the Fourier space, and uh, so this is just uh, the standard formula of these modulus equations. And uh, and uh, one can see that uh, so far this amplification factor is uh, determined by this gamma factor, which is only relevant uh, to the uh, axing couplings and axing masses. And this uh, growing time is also relevant, uh, only relevant to this axing masses. Um, and uh, as some conclusion, it has been shown that uh, yeah, when k equals uh, well, when k equals uh, one, uh, one, one half of the axis masses, and these equations will be potentially grossed. Um, yeah, it's more easier to see the time evolution of this uh, more different modes uh, numerically. And uh, so this b plus and b minus is just uh, two different modes of this maximum fields, or say the uh, amplitude of this uh, photons. So, so, so numerically, it can see clearly that so this x is a time, uh, uh, time evolution. Y is just uh, the amplitude of two different modes, and uh, this photon is the uh, the it can be a kind of is potentially enhanced. And also here we saw in this uh, we show the time evolution of this energy density, and you can see that uh, the energy density of these gamma photons is growing, and, uh, but the energy density of this icing cloud is decreasing. So that means that uh, the energy is transferred from these axons to the, to the gamma photons through this, uh, at this channel. And the one key parameter is that uh, this frequency of these gamma photons is just one half of these axing masses. So that's kind of matching with the uh, channel that this, uh, so in, particle point of view is kind of axing decay into two gamma photons. But in the wave point of view, it's just, uh, yeah, it's 
actually uh, properties of these Maxwell equations that uh, this kind of view modes is uh, highly enhanced or resonanced due to this uh, couplings of these uh, transcendence terms. Um, so this is a kind of has been well known in the lit literatures and uh, and also actually uh, here uh, one can show that the similar efforts can also be happened in the uh, transcendence modified gravities. Uh, uh, um, in this, the only difference is that we can uh, change the coupling between axions uh, and uh, photons into gravitons. And here, one using this switch, uh, uh, Riemann tensors, and this articular is similar uh, definition as the hood do. And this part is still the axions. And uh, so this is the key couplings, which is called uh, the gravitational transcendence terms. And also the A is kind of dynamical. And uh, so as expected, uh, we can all have similar uh, growth, but before that we just simply take the correctional perturbations. And then the usually sourceless uh, plan, plan, plan wave, uh, correctional waves will be kind of sourced. And this part is similar to the, uh, due to these transcendence terms. And again, we take uh, similar uh, decomposition's of this uh, modes into the uh, left hand and the right hand circularization modes. And you will find that these questional uh, equations will also be uh, uh, decoupled into uh, two modes. And each mode is a kind of, uh, it's not a module uh, equations, but, uh, but basically they have a similar uh, kernel parts that uh, in some parameter ranges, so this mode will be enhanced. And also the uh, axiom equi uh, equation motions is also sourced by this uh, transcendence terms. And one can find that uh, this uh, the growth factor is also only relevant uh, to the uh, transcendence couplings and axiom masses, but with a kind of different order. Uh, in previous uh, Maxwell field, it's just uh, once, but uh, here we have the um, uh, yeah, cubic orders. Um, and the here, yeah, the, the order estimation is actually only yeah, relevant to the coupling of this uh, transcendence modified gravity. And this coupling is actually uh, not the fact the speed of light is so that it has not uh, been constrained uh, to the current observations. And also, it's more easier to see how the uh, gravitational mode is enhanced, and here we already take the log. Uh, uh, um, uh, the coordinate and the x is the time evolution. And you can see that uh, both the uh, left hand and the right hand mode of this uh, gravitational waves can be exponentially enhanced due to this uh, log behavior. And also here we show that how the energy was transferred from this. Uh, axions to this uh, gravitational modes, and, uh, and this is the uh, energy density of this uh, icing cloud. And this part is the growth of the uh, gravitational waves, and you can find that uh, after some time, and uh, this kind of growth will become uh, unstable, and there might be a kind of burst of phenomena can be happened. Uh, yeah, basically, one require a more um, uh, numerical studies, but actually, but here we still consider the flat background to show that uh, the key 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 future is still happened due to this resonance efforts in the equation motions. Um, okay, so and, and then is that how how we are whether uh, the signal is strong enough? So we need to uh, compare that. Uh, the branch ratios, yeah. So, so one of the studied ratio is the axiom dt into gamma photons, and another we consider here is axiom dt decaying into the gravitational waves. This branch ratio is only relevant to the coupling constant, and uh, and now as a kind of uh, background, and uh, and we consider because this channel is assumed to be maybe relevant to the uh, faster rate of burst. And so, yeah, we're using it as a kind of uh, benchmark power and to estimate what kind of 
or how strong of these gravitational signals can be uh, can be enhanced. And uh, and but before that, basically, if you assume that uh, the total power of this axing cloud is uh, at the same order with this fast radio burst, which is given by the uh, 10 to uh, 42 energies in uh, one second, and uh, so so in case you assume these powers, and it's easy to make this estimation that uh, uh, from the relation between the power and the strain of the gravitational waves that h square is relevant to p over this distance square and mu square, and uh, so at the gigahertz it can be found that actually yeah this wave is very not easy to be detected. Uh, but in case we go beyond the very low frequency ranges, and uh, and uh, in that sense, this uh, signal can still be enhanced to to in the detectable range, uh, for example, to ten to minus twenty. Um, and uh, but on the other hand, if we consider, yeah, since since this uh, coupling of the uh, Transcendence coupling is, is not uh, bounded by the current experiments. And in case we consider this power of Gaussian wave is, is much higher than this uh, fast radio burst. Uh, in that sense, even at the high frequency range, we can also have uh, uh, very uh, strong signals due to this transcendence coupling. Um, yeah, to see this more clearly, also with better to joint analyze these two efforts directly, so we consider both of these uh, axon voltage couplings and axon gravity couplings. And in that sense, the uh, gravitational wave equations is sourced by this uh, transcendence uh, gravity, uh, gravity couplings. And also, there is also secondary efforts due to the uh, oscillation of the gamma photons and axons. And, uh, and the Maxwell field uh, will be modified uh, still be sourced by this axon part, but the axon equations will be sourced by this uh, photon couplings and the graviton couplings. Um, and the, except that there is also the traditional uh, signatures, for example, the transition between uh, excited states of the axons to lower energy state, so there will be also uh, the uh, emission of gravitons uh, and we can actually yeah, estimate the order of these channels but uh, through the uh, traditional quadratic uh, uh, estimations and uh, actually they can uh, be finite uh, uh, for this uh, yeah, sorry, for, for this part it's a kind of possible signals but for the uh, yeah, for the secondary effort actually it can be estimated through these uh, traditional equations, and it can be found that actually, yeah, at uh, uh, at this kind of fast radio burst level, so such kind of energy is uh, this quadratic uh, order is very low. It's still the ten to uh, minus thirty orders in the strands, yeah, although it's in the very high frequency ranges. Um, but if we go to even for the supermassive black holes, we can. Uh, also, as estimate uh, the secondary efforts, which is still very small. So, in principle, we can uh, negate these secondary efforts and only consider this uh, contribution from the uh, transcendence couplings. And uh, here, we also show the numerical uh, or time evolution of these different modes and. Uh, and uh, basically, yeah, so you can see from the red finger that uh, so here is the growth of the gravitational wave modes. Here is the growth of the uh, Maxwell modes. And this is the kind of decay of the axing clouds. And then we also take uh, the log coordinate. So basically the total picture is that this, uh, the energy of this axing cloud is totally transferred to either the gamma photons or gravitons. And it's probably after some uh, benchmark time and all these uh, uh, photon or graviton will uh, become highly resonant and, uh, and there will be some burst that may happen after some time. Um, okay, so the uh, last part. Uh, 
Uh, and anyway, so actually the yeah the mice of the axon is still free parameter in all these uh, all these time evolutions. And if we if we run to relevant to the observations, for example, if we take the mice of the axon to be uh, mu EV, and uh, in that sense, this signal of gamma photons will be in, in gigahertz, which is a kind of source of the radio burst. And uh, but in that sense, the uh, the question wave will also be in gigahertz. Let's see in the huge high frequency uh, ranges, which is uh, outside of current detections. Yeah, although there is some uh, well designed, uh, very uh, like small equivalent that can detect high frequency question waves. Um, but in case we go to yeah much lower axes, which is more favored by the supermassive black holes, and then the the signature due to this transcendent components will actually uh, also in the uh, detection rate of either LIGO or LISA. Yeah, anyway, so so here is the uh, order estimation and uh, then the last part led to see, uh, so in case there is the axon cloud, so what will be the mass range of the host, uh, host black holes? So one, uh, uh, one benchmark parameter is considered the ratio between the Compton wavelengths of these axons and the short radiance of the black holes. Usually it's assumed that uh, yeah, so the, the Compton wavelengths of this, because this axon is already considered as a kind of wavelength, uh, wave-like. So, so usually it's, it's behavior like some axon cloud surrounding the black holes. So, so this uh, parameter is defined as the ratio between the radius of the black hole and uh, this wavelength of these axons. And usually you want to require this parameter to be order one, which is the favored, favored mass range of these axons. And uh, on the other hand, there is also estimation at about different uh, alpha. There is also uh, estimation that uh, how, how long will the axon cloud be to be formed. So basically this tau will required to be less than the current age of the universe. And from this constraints, actually there is a kind of uh, well-used uh, fingers that uh, to show that uh, the uh, relation between this axon masses and uh, the mass of the black holes, uh, which is usually in this uh, linear shade ranges. And uh, for the silver massive black holes, the favorite uh, axon is the, the 10 to minus uh, like 16, and uh, for stellar masses is in the 10 to minus 10, which is your the uh, lower bound of QCD axons. Uh, but actually, if we go to the faster radio burst, which will favor these mu EV axons, and it will show that the whole star projected can be can be in 10 to minus 5 solar masses, which is actually a kind of uh, primordial black holes. Uh, it's, uh, in case it's a black hole, it's primordial, but it uh, in principle can also be other kind of uh, stars or clubs. Yeah, anyway, so the uh, last slide, and uh, here is my summary. So for this axing cloud, it's a kind of uh, uh, very good uh, dark matter conjugate, and it, for the very light axons, it was considered as surrounding the black holes and uh, extract energy from the uh, rotating uh, black holes, and uh, there are some channels has been studied, for example, the uh, decay of the axing modes and uh, also the axing annihilations. And especially for the mu EV axons, it will find that uh, the decay of the axon into gamma photons can be a possible candidate of the uh, faster radio burst. And here we show that, uh, yeah, whether we can have similar burst of gaussian waves. And uh, in case we open these transcendence couplings between axon and uh, gravitons, so similar burst can happen. And especially this coupling is not constrained because it does not affect the wave, the speed of the gravitational waves. And, uh, but unluckily, if we only consider gigahertz, and uh, so the power of fast radio bursts uh, the, uh, cannot produce enough gravitational waves. It was very small. But in case we consider a uh, uh, um, much uh, larger power of this, uh, gravitational wave couplings, or we go very lower frequency ranges, it's hopeful to have uh, higher uh, higher uh, signals. And also in case for these mu EV axons, the host uh, 
might be a primordial black holes. So there will be a very interesting phenomena by further observations. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, we are complete with the time, but if there is an urgent question, it might be asked. Is there a question from the audience? No question, okay. Then we thank you again for your interesting talk. And the uh, last talk of the session is now presented by Remo Ruffini. Uh, the director of ICRANET about the geodesic motion of S2 and G2 as a test of the fermionic dark matter nature of our galactic core. So, please, Remo, you may start. We cannot hear you. Okay. Good. Uh, we we are trying to make some uh, last minute uh, addition that you will see I, I hope at the end of my talk. Uh, the um, topic I'm discussing today is a very recent work which was done in collaboration with Edward Becerra, Vergara, Carlos Arguelles. Uh, Andreas Kruth and Olger Wede. It's very timely because this paper was just uh, accepted on the 26th of July of this year and is going to be printed a little later due to the pandemic on the 6th of September. Therefore, there is no way to be more uh, up to date than this. Um, <clears throat> I uh, start uh, uh, trying to introduce conceptually why this uh, re new result is so fundamental. And there is no way to be more fundamental than to look at this uh, um, image of uh, Albert Einstein and Planck. And Einstein introduced a unit of length in a gravitating system, GM divided by C square, and uh, the, a classical uh, dimension. And in the quantum dimension, the, the Max Planck led to the work of Heisenberg, of Compton, of De Broglie, of introducing the particle, elementary particle wavelength. Now, if you equate these two quantity, namely, if you go from the classical to the quantum level, there is the appearance of a Planck mass determined by this quantity, and this quantity has not been measured yet, either in particle physics or in classical physics, but plays the most fundamental role in the field of relativistic astrophysics. I developed this topic in a recent book, which uh, is going to appear soon, in Einstein, Fermi, Heisenberg, and the World of Relativistic Astrophysics. There, I recall some of the work of Einstein, very important about the Einstein, um, cloud, the, uh, uh, Einstein clouds, uh, particle, and then the work of uh, Fermi on the Thomas Fermi, and uh, also the fundamental work of uh, Heisenberg and Euler. But uh, let's go back to this, uh, uh, to relativistic astrophysics. These were the paper introduced in developing relativistic astrophysics. There is no doubt that relativistic astrophysics started with the Crab Nebula Pulsar in 1967. And uh, in Princeton in 1971, with Johnny Wheeler, collaborators, even Tullio Regge, we started practically the physics which led to the introducing the black hole, uh, which I did with John Wheeler. 
that picture and that uh, paper was really uh, all over the world. But the key factor, the key new factor in introducing the black hole was the use of the Kermetric and also led by the work of Penrose to the possibility in principle of extracting rotational energy from the ergosphere, which we defined with Johnny, of the Kerr black hole. Actually, the name was an ergosphere, but then later we decide ergosphere and the suggestion of Johnny. And uh, indeed, ergosphere is more, much more attractive and is equally valid because ergon is war, the sphere of work in, in, uh, um, uh, in using a war um, analogy of Greek, of, uh, Greek uh, literature. The mass formula came out uh, soon later, in 1970 and 1971. And there we related the mass of the black hole to the charge, to the angular momentum, to the surface area, and also to the most mysterious quantity, which we have heard also during this meeting, very, very interesting talk about the irreducible mass and the meaning of the irreducible mass, which is still one of the topics to be discussed eventually in the next MG16 uh, next year. The work was uh, 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 started in September, 17th of September 1970 by Dimitrios, followed by in March 1st, a work of uh, uh, Christo uh, Dulo and myself. And on March 11th, 1971, the practically analogous derivation by uh, Stephen Hawking and uh, uh, later on, 15th of October, a, a, a second fundamental paper. Of course, uh, all this was based uh, on the uh, on the Kerr black hole, the physics of the Kerr black hole, and it was really a very great joy to um, assist to the Crawford Prize by the King of Sweden to um, Roy Kerr. And soon after that ceremony in Stockholm we decided to visit uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in Cambridge Stephen Hawking and was really beautiful to have the, this long length occasion of a dinner at his place with Roy Kerr and uh, the wife of Roy, myself and Stephen. The key point which is really at the basis of Black Hole is the hope to explain, the, to extract this energy. We have heard a lot about this topic in this meeting, and a big result are on the verge of being obtained to extract the rotational energy of the black hole. And this is certainly a topic very active in which we will lead uh, um, the possibility to extract this energy to express uh, specifically the high energy emission of GRB, we are making a lot of progress on that, and similarly, the high energy GEV emission of active galactic nuclei. But uh, let's go back. Um, this we will uh, prepare for MG16 next year. But let's go back to what is all happening today. What is happening today has been prepared by a fantastic collaboration of uh, um, uh, uh, the largest number, the, uh, the largest uh, size optical infrared telescope on uh, the surface of the Earth. The uh, very large telescope used uh, by uh, uh, ESO in uh, Chile, here there are some beautiful pictures, and um, and also the work of uh, the Keck Observatory uh, from uh, Manuakea, which has allowed to follow 
the trajectory looking in the core of, uh, of uh, our galaxy and uh, the equally beautiful and important observation by G Gemini North Telescope by the National Science Foundation and the National Optical Infrared Astronomical Research Laboratory in uh, also in Manuakea. And these are some uh, fantastic and beautiful pictures of this observatory, uh, which has been crucial for uh, in collaboration with the VLT of ESO and uh, the Keck Observatory to look uh, in the galactic center. And together with this team of uh, uh, observatory, there has been still in the uh, in the Y the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, the Subaru Telescope, and has been thanks to the collaboration of this inter largest possible one of the largest, if not the largest, collaboration. On the, uh, uh, is, uh, in the history of astronomy on the planet Earth, that a scrutiny has been happened in the direction of uh, the galactic center. And I have a picture, unfortunately, uh, due to technical reason, we cannot show the animation, but uh, I hope to be able thanks to the help of some local people here who are helping in real time to show you this, uh, this uh, animation at the end of my talk and show clearly that these stars, these S stars, are moving, are moving around a very dense object which is uh, uh, definitely described by general relativity. And in particular, there is a star, S2, in which we see to recent years precisely the, pe not the periastron, but, but the pericenter motion of uh, S2. I promise, if everything goes well, to show this uh, animation at the end of my talk. The great point, the main point of uh, understanding what there is there, one, uh, uh, one uh, possibility has been uh, a massive black hole of 10 to the, uh, 6 solar masses, and uh, we will explore a different possibility because the problem of our galaxy, the ma big major problem of our galaxy, are really two. Not only the galactic core to be very close to the Schwarzschild radii, but there is another very serious problem that the flat rotation curve of galaxy show presence of dark matter, ten times more than visible matter, in all the halo of the galaxy. Therefore, the problem we are trying to solve is the problem what is at the core of the galaxy and what is in the halo. The question is, can a work done in Princeton in 1969 be of help? Well, we did a work with, uh, uh, in, uh, in Princeton under the assistance of uh, uh, John Archibald Wheeler on system or self-gravitating particle in general relativity and especially addressing the problem of uh, the equation of state. And, and in contradiction to the concept of an equation of state or implementation of uh, a different approach, we look at Boson's self-gravitating and for Fermion self-gravitating. We wrote the Klein-Gordon equation, and we have heard even in the last talk today of Yung Bong Zhang, how far this uh, coupling of a scalar field to, uh, with a massive 
field in Einstein general relativity have gone. But already in that paper, we show something very important, that uh, the, this equation could be written in terms uh, uh, of the Planck mass. And in particular, that the number of bosons self-gravitating can reach only a maximum mass, a critical mass, which formula is uh, given same, very simply by the Planck mass square divided by the mass of the boson. Similarly, we did an approach in, uh, in the fermion st star, and uh, that, that, that approach was uh, using uh, the Thomas Fermi equation for the atom to make a gravitational uh, 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 formulation of a Thomas Fermi, not uh, an atom uh, with electrons and nuclei, but to massive pro, uh, spermian self-gravitating. This, uh, uh, this, uh, this article uh, uh, has been, all this field has been developed enormously, and especially for the boson uh, with Baldeschi, Germini, and uh, we pro propose um, something which appeared to be at the time very weird, that the bosons could be uh, to have a radius of boson of the order of the galaxy. This uh, was fantastic, and uh, we that was absolutely um, uh, unexpected to think about uh, self-gravitating boson for the galaxy. I tried to speak to Johnny Wheeler and said, well, we will have to wait for this idea. But anyway, what happens is that the boson, uh, for if we want to interpret for a galaxy, should have a mass of 10 minus 24 electron volt. We published that, but surprisingly, this idea caught up. And uh, in particular, Jerry Ostreicher at the last meeting in, in uh, MG15, 2015, presented uh, a fantastic talk in which he, he explained the structure, many of the structure of the galaxy, which are that very, very, very tiny uh, bosons. What can I tell you today? Well, I can tell you only that the mass of 10 minus 63 gram was adopted at that time. But uh, yesterday, just preparing this talk, I found something very interesting, that if you look at the critical mass of the self boson, it comes 10 to the 20 solar masses. And 10 to the 20 solar mass is all the mass in the universe. Therefore, if there is a black hole from bosons of this mass, it, it, it coincides with the mass of the universe. Uh, let's go back a moment still uh, with fermion stars. Uh, the fermion star were, were uh, uh, sat so satisfy this equation. Everybody will recognize that this equation is just the same as the Thomas Fermi equation, where instead of the minus sign, you have the plus sign. And I always remember um, Eugene Wigner in Princeton asking why It, uh, the, it works so well. And then adding uh, the Thomas Fermi model works, works, works with the V. Uh, he used to say works much better than it should. <laughs> well, anyway, yes, we have developed this model of, uh, based on an analogy with Thomas Fermi and everybody can read a review of the development in this paper with uh, Orger Weda, but uh, also there is another work, for this is for the non-rotating non um, system, and uh, an analogous work with Cipolletta, Filippi, Cherubini, Weda, myself, 
äh, trägt der Käse. Auf Rote, die Neutronstarren geben die absolute Upper Mass to the, uh, the critical mass of the Neutronstar. But then let's go back now to the field we are interested in general relativistic treatment of the dark matter of the galactic center. We will use the precession of the perihelion, the gravitational redshift, the equation of motion of uh, a system of self-gravitating uh, system of dark matter, semi-degenerate fermions. This is different uh, from the traditional work we did uh, in Princeton in the past. It, the, the system of the, this dark matter particle is not degenerate, but semi-degenerate. And this is essential in order to describe not only the core, but also the halo of, uh, halo of our uh, galaxy. And then uh, we have to, to implement something new, very important to describe the, uh, the, not only the core, but also the halo, a, a new concept of uh, cutoff in phase space of the dark matter component. And this was not enough because we had to treat not only self-gravitating semi-degenerate fermions, but also in presence uh, of the baryonic matter distribution of the galaxy. There have been two or three, pa three papers which have been fundamental. The first one on the, uh, on the core halo distribution of dark matter in galaxy with uh, uh, Arguelles and Rueda. There we introduced the cutoff, there we introduced the equation, the semi-degenerate distribution, and all this beautiful uh, um, uh, uh, new quantity. It, and of course, everything had to be implemented in uh, the Planck mass, because the sky function, which is the key point, is expressed again as a function of the mark, of the Planck of the ratio between the mass of this Eno and the Planck mass. The second paper, which has been extremely important, was led by Krut and in collaboration uh, with Aguelles, myself, uh, and of course, Weda, in which uh, we start to look for uh, a configuration in the core and compare and contrast the our co configuration of the core with the existing author model um, uh, 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 in uh, the dark matter distribution and uh, um, and start to play with uh, the mass of the uh, of this eno and attempt uh, um, attempt for mass of 0 06 kv 48 kv and 345 kv and uh, in correspondence we found these uh, different lines uh, and uh, the yellow, uh, this was for uh, uh, 48 kV, this for 06 kV, and this uh, for 345 kV. Clearly the one more interesting were the one in uh, this region where the S stars were observed, the one which I will show the animation at the end. And therefore, the basic mo model is the one I presented in the previous slide, which after the author we call the uh, RAR model. And this is the ARAR model applied to different uh, ENO masses. And then comes the recent work. The recent work, the best fit that can have to the core of the of the uh, galaxy, the observed one, and the dark matter distribution corresponding from the core all the way to the to the border of the of the halo, 
and the characteristic mass of this uh, degenerate uh, core is 3.5 times 10 to 6 with a fermion mass of uh, 56 kV. But let's go and start to look at the result. We have two stars that we fit. One is the S2, which has periodic motion, which has observed through the years by all this uh, fantastic set of observatory, and on which we have refined data for both the precession of the periastro, pericenter, and uh, the gravitational waves, and the gravitational redshift, and the equation of motion. But there is another system which was, uh, which was uh, studied in great detail by Gillesen, that is a flyby of the galactic core by this uh, other object, G2. And uh, is by fitting the two, para the two systems, S2 and G2, which we manage to obtain our result and how the tail result, how the tail result with uh, um, uh, on uh, which led to the unique determination of the mass of the Eno of dark matter. And by that by this time we have introduced not only the value of the mass, but also a name of this Eno of dark matter coming out from the same degenerate configuration. And we call this new object a dark kino. The fit of the data are here represented for the S2 data. And here on the right, we have the corresponding chi-square for the presence of a black hole and for our model. The chi-square are really comparable. It's very hard to distinguish them on the chi-square level. The chi-square for the black hole is 3.3. Our chi-square is 3.07. It's a little better, but not significantly. Therefore, the two systems are equally, scientifically, equally valid from the trajectory. The next point instead is uh, the, the trajectory of, uh, uh, okay, still on this, okay, um, we have the, the two trajectory of the line of sight radial, the, the, the line of sight velocity the equation of motion of the particle around the S2. And here again, you see that both treatments are practically indistinguishable. And again, the chi-square is uh, 3.3 versus 3.07. Therefore, not only the precession of the pericenter, but also the equation of motion of S2 in both systems are practically overlapping. But then let's go back, and the same also, excuse me, for the redshift. We can explain the gravitational redshift equally well in both systems. And here in the red are the one of our RR, RR, RR uh, uh, model, and below the one of the, of the black hole. They are practically overlapping. But where they are not overlapping is uh, in the distribution of S2 ar around of the, the orbit of J2. There is a misprint in, the, in this, should be J2, uh, around Sagittarius A. And uh, this trajectory are clearly, they are very different um, in, uh, if, we, if you look at our equation here, the, when you look at the 
uh, equation of motion of um, of j of j2 yes the equation the radial velocity of j2 in red we have we have uh, our solution and in blue there is the gillesen solution representing the gillesen solution representing the motion of g2 around and uh, the, they are absolutely outfit is much better and the fit by the black hole needs a viscosity and additional term. We don't need a viscosity. We don't need additional term to Einstein equation. We just have to solve Einstein equation for a self-gravitating system of semi-degenerate uh, fermions. And this gives precisely the fit of this data. These are, uh, in summary, the conclusion. There is no black hole appear to exist in the, our galactic center. We have evidence for a diffuse skeleton of semi-degenerate neutral dark matter fermionic inos, the dark inos. They pervade the entire galaxy from the core, where we see and measure all the relativistic effect, to the halo all the way to the border of our galaxy. The dark matter creates the gravitational cradle in which the baryonic matter, the baryonic matter and the stars stably reside inside our entire galaxy. The mass of the Darkino is 56 kV, or one-tenth roughly of the mass of the electron. I will, before closing, I would like to go back to the beginning, to recalling uh, uh, not only Einstein and Planck, but recalling John Archibald Wheeler, as we call him, Johnny. He was the first to emphasize while we were working in uh, re-editing re my paper in, uh, in Princeton for two years to use the Planck mass in bosons and Fermi star. We practiced this and we succeeded. And now, uh, at this day, I ask him, but tell me, who introduced this name, Planck mass? And he was for a while uh, uh, in in doubt, and then he said, well, look for some old article you will find. It was a, a very modest way for Johnny to express himself. <laughs> and uh, he expressed himself that way. Okay, let's uh, stay like that and call the Planck mass. Johnny profound help, inspiration, and visions in Princeton have influenced a generation of students, collaborators, and astrophysicists worldwide. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond, for this very interesting, inspiring talk with uh, important results. We are a bit over the time, but is, is there some, some question? There is uh, first uh, the animation of that picture. I hope you can see it, which I just yes. saw before. Um, uh, uh, here you have the S stars, moving around the galactic center. S2 is the yellow one. And uh, on the right, you see really, in reality, the precession of the pericenter of S2. Okay. okay. We, we, we succeeded in that. Okay. So was a question? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, it's a, very, it's a very nice talk. I would like to know, um, will there be some difference for the black hole shadow uh, for Citera A star? 
Um, we will discuss this matter at MG 16. Let, uh, first of all, uh, I enjoyed very much your talk. And, um, and um, the problem, there is a very, very, very important uh, a new result co coming up very strongly that we are able to extract finally what we call the black holic energy what is the black holic energy is the energy which can be extracted from the care black hole and there are big news on this we are can, I don't go to speak today, but next year will be dedicated mainly to this and to the observation of uh, uh, the extraction of energy and the jet in, uh, in GRB, but also the extraction of energy and the jet in, uh, um, in, uh, um, uh, uh, in the uh, M87, you know, all the large galactic uh, um, uh, uh, nuclei, active galactic nuclei. Be patient for uh, 12 months and uh, we will show you what thing new we have about the shadow. I think we have a lot of news. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there more questions? Uh, so, so I have a short question about the laser part. And uh, is there a couplings between such a kind of uh, dark matter and the bionic matter, so standard model particles, or uh, how large it, or maybe or uh, right just this short one? Okay, this is a very interesting question. And uh, I was inspired by one of the talk today. L let me put simply, first of all, in order, in order, in order to create the dark matter condensation in the core, we need to have different phenomena. One could be violent relaxation, one could be the evaporation due uh, to uh, from the halo but there could be also a necessity possibly of a new interaction for the moment our model is the simplest possible model it's a model of particle fermion just uh, verifying general relativity quantum statistic and evaporation. But in my opinion, the next step is to try to see if there is some additional interaction. There should be. Not necessarily traditional. Of course, uh, there is a work going on on sterile neutrino and things of this kind. But maybe there is a much more sophisticated approach. If I have to tell the truth, I was very inspired by the talk of G. E. Tzu in this meeting, in which he came back to the idea of interaction advanced by our good friend T. D. Lee and Frank Young. Maybe there is something more to find in this uh, in th this uh, very important work of this very eminent. Uh, Chinese uh, scientist. Okay, thank you very much. Are there more questions? Uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, to uh, Professor Raffaini. So, yes, by the yes. dynamics. Excuse me? Hello? I cannot hear. Would you please repeat your question? Hello? I, uh, I cannot. Somehow he disappeared. 
<laughs> okay, so let's hope it's not an effect of a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there further questions? Not then. We thank you again and all the other speakers of this last session of this conference. And since we are the last session, I think I also uh, would like to uh, thank the main organizers of this conference, uh, Chiang Mai yes. Chen and also Irene Ko, who are who uh, put a lot of efforts to uh, bring together this uh, this conference in this different time in this difficult times. So I think everybody of us is very glad that we could attend this meeting and that you made this effort. So thank you very much for for doing all this work. And perhaps uh, maybe Chiang Mai Chen also gives some last words for this conference, for closing this conference. Hey, excuse me, uh, just a moment. Uh, uh, my, my communication just now is something wrong. I still uh, have a question for uh, Professor okay. Raffini. Okay. So uh, we, we, we all now know the uh, black hole uh, pictures as we, we, we already see last year. Also, we have a great wave environment so far. So now we got the dynamic environment, the orbit. So my question is, can we got more exactly hints about the black hole, like the uh, by the S2 orbit to got more properties for the center in this galaxy? Thank you. I, I think uh, 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 the question is clear that there is uh, an enormous amount of work in front of us. Namely, one thing is to see uh, if it's really a black hole, this is the key point, or if it's just a system of self-gravitating. Uh, party fermions, uh, semi-degenerate. Both of them are from the chi-square very similar, but the physics of one, the physics of the dark matter, is uh, much more globally interesting in the sense that it does not only look at the core of the galaxy, but to the entire galaxy. This field of Darkino is just at the starting point. Much more will be done in the future. I have seen even today, from the initial idea of the boson star, how much the system has been evolving in the previous talk. Uh, okay, I expect even more changes to be introduced by dark matter. The dark matter give not only in our interpretation the center of the galaxy and very 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 similar to a black hole but we have to distinguish them for example to uh, this work uh, uh, which uh, we have seen about the flight by um, uh, uh, which we have seen uh, but uh, we have to keep going to from 58 kV to see what it can say on the large straight, uh, large um, configuration of the uh, dark matter in not in the galaxy but extra galactic and in the large scale structure of the universe and it's very likely that we will find other darkino one darkino is this one of 58 kV but certainly there could be another Darkino uh, of uh, smaller mass for the largest scale structure of the universe. We are just opening the field of the dark matter astrophysics with the, with a beautiful uh, use of the physics of our own galaxy. Okay. Thank you very much. More questions? Not Maybe Chen Mei can give uh, some uh, discussion. 
And thanks, first of all. I would like also to express myself uh, to thank uh, very strongly and very much with all the people that in this pandemic have managed to organize such a beautiful talk. To me, the most uh, impressive part, and of this, of course, we have to, have to thank Chen Mei and Irene, like uh, Klaus already did, but to me, the most interesting part is the, to have seen so many new young people coming in front and to present very exciting results. We have to keep going. We have to uh, um, take the experience of this meeting. We need, uh, this is not equivalent to the traditional Marcel Grossman meeting because there we have the fight, the discussion alive, and uh, a very important way to interact. But still, I think we should find a way, and very difficult to follow everyone, but to find a way to register and to put online as soon as possible all the participation, and then to have the way to, pro to have feedback from all the participants and to a larger audience worldwide of these results. Uh, we will have to practice with the organizer, with all the organizer and uh, also within ourselves, with Klaus Lammerzal, who is uh, uh, in the board of MG uh, meetings. Uh, we have to think how to, with your help, to, how to get this uh, uh, a uh, uh, new method which I'm sure will be leading in the future to optimize the feedback, the presence, the communication, the time zone, and um, to reach a new level of uh, the uh, to, uh, to forward the field of relativistic astrophysics. But what is very impressive is the participation of so many young and talented people. Thank you, Chen Mai, Chen, uh, Chen Mei, and thank you, Irene. And thank you, all the organizers and okay. the board of Ica. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, Lemon, for, for this uh, closing speech, I, I expect. Okay, so now we, we finish our scientific program. So I, I would like to thank all the chair who helped to coordinate this conference and all the speakers who who share all the interesting uh, research results and uh, of course all the participants for joining this meeting. Okay, so I, I would like to thank uh, the, all the people who helped to organize this conference, uh, in particular uh, a student, Jiang Wu, Jiang Wu Chen, he may not be in uh, online because his, his major is not in this field, who helped to uh, set up the web page and of course the, the, secretary, uh, the secretary Hillary, but probably she also not online, well, who help uh, to take care about all the all the uh, issue on the financial support? This always be headed to me. Okay. And I also to say uh, say thank you to Elena. Okay, I, I think you already know she can see what uh, how she helped during this five day to to call, uh, to uh, take care about this conference room and uh, can to solve the problem immediately. Okay, so now that's making our, uh, our our program can go smoothly. Okay, so so now I think this is uh, ICGSC 14 is is closed, and uh, so we are looking for uh, the next meeting. And uh, the next meeting will be three years later. I'm not sure where uh, which which place yet, but uh, but I hope you you continue to support this series and uh, can participate to the next meeting. I will send you the the information once I, we have more. Uh, uh, we already decide which place, and uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.